Welcome to our second session. Today, retired Army Chaplain Janet Horton and I, Rob Vanderlyk, also an Army veteran, will continue our discussion on the preventative and healing prayer that can support persons who are concerned about PTSD. We'll consider Daniel, who was literally thrown in a den of lions and came through that extremely unusual trial without any harm. The Bible records, he did so showing a calm and wise demeanor through the entire experience. We will also study some of the details discussed in the Bible when a young shepherd boy named David faced a giant enemy soldier to fight so thousands wouldn't be killed. The prophet Isaiah gives us insight into how this could occur for faithful, prayerful persons and records God's word on this. Quote, I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. End quote. In the introduction of the book of Daniel, it says that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in learning and wisdom so visibly that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, turned to them in all matters of wisdom and understanding. It states that he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. The Bible records that they had a commitment to be pure in every regard. Sometime later, None of the other governors could find any occasion or fault in Daniel when the king elevated him to the highest position, preferring him over any of the other presidents or princes. They were so jealous, they tricked the king into signing a decree that anyone who prayed to God or man for 30 days would be cast into the den of lions. These jealous men knew Daniel would obediently pray to God every day, no matter what the human penalty was judged to be. Yet Daniel knew a much more spiritual truth. He knew there could be no penalty for praying regularly. Just the opposite, it would bless him and protect him. He knew sincere, regular prayer was an armor for him. No matter how dire mankind dictated the penalty for it would be. His trust in God was unshakable, pure, and unfailing. Daniel quietly, calmly, and unfailingly continued his daily discipline of prayer, despite the humanly dangerous decree that he be cast into the den of lions for doing so. He made prayer an absolute priority, even beyond what might have conveniently helped him avoid human attempts to punish him for his piety. It isn't uncommon to observe the subtle way jealousy and human ambitions to hold the highest positions of power can delude people. They may at such times attempt to justify immoral acts to attain or maintain oppressive influence. Sometimes, as in this Bible story, people yield to a sense of competition that justifies hurting their subordinates or peers, etc., to navigate such high-pressure situations without harm may indeed require the whole armor of God. This spiritual sense of protection includes a true and redeeming sense of what dominion really is. Dominion is spoken of in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. Quote, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. End quote. Numerous experiences recorded by countless Bible figures show how they were able to turn in prayer and experience their God-given heritage of dominion. The Bible clearly shows us God's purpose for man was not subjection. Dominion would be the opposite of subjection to fear, doubt, or anxiety 
and other emotions that would stress or misguide humans. Dominion is unopposed spiritual power. Daniel was so pure in his heart, he didn't waver. Prayer was the priority in his life. The Bible recorded the king was displeased with himself for being pulled into signing the decree that no one could pray except to him for 30 days, and that he declared publicly to Daniel that he knew that thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. In that important declaration, he highlighted two important recognitions. First, that Daniel served God continually and that no human powers could trump that, and that God, as Daniel understood and worshipped him, would deliver a faithful follower from any danger. These are all lessons that help anyone who studies these Bible texts to prepare for living in strange lands. Daniel was a man of prayer who looked to God and acknowledged God as the spiritual source of his well-being and the wisdom, knowledge, and skill he expressed in learning life's lessons. There would be no human explanation for why hungry lions wouldn't eat anyone thrown into their den. Yet at that extreme moment, God shut the lion's mouths and protected his devoted worshiper who turned to prayer instead of human limited means. God was equal to even the most extreme material challenge when Daniel showed he didn't fear human terror, but did absolutely know his purity, devotion, and love for God was certainly a power beyond anything men could contrive in this complicated situation. There was no fear, no anger, no resentment or self-righteous indignation in Daniel's heart for the beast to feed upon. He quietly prayed and came through the night unharmed. When the king called to him the next morning, he explained that God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth because he was innocent. If we are morally sound and pray, we also experience the blessing in trusting God. The Bible states that no manner of hurt was found on him because he believed in his God. It might be tempting to think that such protection and resiliency in the face of such an extreme threat from beasts of the field might have been possible in Bible times, but it couldn't be valid in our times. Mary Baker Eddy agreed with the present power of the truth in her Christian science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, page 304, when she noted that, quote, Christ's teachings are practical and complete. They are not deprived of their essential vitality, end quote. Janet, why don't you share a similar unusual experience you had in the Army when you were in the desert? Yes, Rob, I had an experience early in my military career that affirmed the present power of the word in what happened to be a dangerous situation. I joined some other chaplains for their early morning physical training. The guys were discussing running out to a desert foothill you could see in the distance. The male chaplains cautioned me it was too far, but I explained I'd been running six to nine miles a day with my infantry unit. Then they reluctantly agreed I could try to do the run. None of us were desert people, so we weren't familiar with the illusion of distances. After about three miles of running, it became clear it was probably ten times the distance it appeared to be. We also realized we had to run back. I had been praying to take my mind off the length of the run. All of a sudden, I realized that I was alone and wondered where the guys went. I looked around to see a pack of hungry coyotes were out looking for their morning breakfast. They began to growl and circle me. When the lead dog growled and moved in, the others would close in tighter. Because I had been praying throughout the run, I never remember feeling any sense of fear. A wonderful Bible lesson that day from the book of Numbers 
had been about those who went into recon the land of Canaan. Some gave an evil report and said it was a land that devoured its people and was inhabited by giants. But Caleb gave a good and true report. Right where the men he journeyed with saw a dangerous situation, Caleb saw a land that flowed with milk and honey and felt that the people were able to possess it. Having been praying without ceasing, I felt very prepared during the run. I did, however, feel a sense of gravity to the situation as the circling coyotes began to close in. Next, I recall the Bible account of Daniel in the lion's den and how his heart was pure and how there was no fear, animalistic tendency, nor hate that he'd been thrown into the lion's den. There was nothing impure in his heart or mind for the lions to feed on. I, too, had been expressing joy for being included in the run. I prayed to hear the still, small voice of God's word for this situation. What came to me was, get down and speak to the lead coyote. So I got down on one knee. When I knelt, the lead coyote lay down. Then all the other coyotes did also and became very attentive. What happened literally was an example of preach the gospel to every creature. Starting with the first chapter of Genesis, in the beginning, I told them that God created the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that therein is. He divided the light from the darkness. He created every creeping thing upon the earth. He saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. I was also praying with this idea from the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, by Mary Baker Eddy, that, quote, All of God's creatures, moving in the harmony of science, are harmless, useful, indestructible, end quote, page 514. The lead coyote would nod his head when I pointed at him as one of God's creatures, or that all God made was very good. He said to the lead coyote, you have a purpose, but it's not to harm me, and I have a purpose, and it's not to harm you. You need to be about your father's business, but it's not here. Then I said, you need to go now. I waved my hand upward and then pointed out into the desert. The lead coyote popped off and took off, and all the other coyotes followed him. It was then I realized the men had seen the coyotes coming and had sprinted ahead. Some had climbed a brick wall. Others were up in a couple of trees. When they knew the coyotes were gone, they climbed down and began to sort of fess up. Some admitted they had been holding anger and resentment about women being forced into the chaplaincy. Another chaplain said he never thought our church should have been allowed to have military chaplains. Although it seemed as if there was a lot of ravenous thought, it had no voice or authority in the end. One man remarked that if I could preach to wild dogs and they'd listen, well, that probably meant that soldiers would too. We all got a big laugh out of that, and it took the edge off the events. In the military, we're fond of saying the bottom line is God was opening the petals of a holy purpose. If these events occur, then the bottom line is that they occur to bless us. God had brought all the right elements together. Often the events he uses defy every predetermined expectation you could have. That experience invariably comes to my thought when I read Ezekiel 34. Quote, and they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the field devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. End quote. God can literally protect us from any danger and can use the experience to teach us more about the expansiveness of his dominion and the blessings that accompany any experience when we listen to his word 
and stand on the holy ground of the recognition that he reigns over all. No matter what we are facing in our day, God is preparing the way. He is also giving us dominion over the limited ways that are only self-will. He shows us that when we listen for his guidance, the way grows brighter with each advancing step. We have a purpose and promise that uplifts and protects our actions and our tasks. Our day doesn't have to feel like exhausting drudgery or discouraging long or an uninspiring trek of dangerous terrain to navigate. We're never in it alone. Right where we are, we can know it is God's day. Each of God's children are instructed by him to live a holy life. Quote, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 Mrs. Eddy agreed with that spiritual teaching when she pointed out that everyone, every person, man, has a noble destiny. Now, let's also consider the resiliency and effectiveness of a young man whose preparation for military service was shepherding sheep. Despite the modest background and unconventional lack of military service, when things got to the most challenging event in a great war, it was this young Hebrew shepherd, David, who volunteered to face a giant, experienced warrior so other Hebrews wouldn't be killed in an all-out battle with the Philistines. The warrior that represented the Philistines, Goliath, was everything human reasoning would suggest a warrior needed to be. He was much larger, he had considerable prior battle experience, and had all the shields and weapons of the day. He had a state-of-the-art sword, spear, and shield. Yet David was simply seeking justice and trusted the modest defense system he had used to protect sheep from aggressive and ravenous beasts. He knew he could trust these modest weapons now because he trusted God would and could help him be an example of what was spiritually powerful. His trust in God when beasts would attempt to attack the sheep always prevented his sheep from any harm. He had proven his faith and seen God's power many times in his life. It was his regular practice to turn to God for any help he needed. Mrs. Eddy wisely understood that, quote, moral and spiritual might belong to spirit, unquote, God, and that your, quote, influence for good depends on the weight you throw into the right scale. The good you do and embody gives you the only power obtainable. Evil is not power, end quote. David knew it was right for him to defend his sheep. He was confident that God would be with him when he was guided to volunteer to defend his nation when they were searching for someone who could stand up to Goliath's threat. In the book of James in the Bible, the author lauds God's judgment in such situations. Quote, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. David had always been a humble follower of God's teachings. David selflessly volunteered to face Goliath. In 1 Samuel, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. The Lord that delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. He took his staff and chose him five smooth stones and put them in a shepherd's bag. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and there was no sword in the hand of David. David showed everyone that 
listening to God's guidance and will and being obedient to what God instructed him to do was incredibly powerful despite the belief that what seemed to be perceived as materially inferior weaponry by human definition did triumph over Goliath. He trusted that God was the power that would deliver the aggressor into his hands and that it was God's omnipotence and omniscience, his infinite knowledge and spiritual power that would prevail over any human hatred or attacks. Let's consider why Daniel and David, as well as so many persons in the Bible, recovered gracefully from numerous experiences that today would automatically be labeled traumatic. It's important to examine what enabled them to do so. Let's start at the beginning of the Bible. The very first words in the Bible in the book of Genesis are, In the beginning, God. Faith starts with recognizing God is a present power in our world. The Apostle John assures us God is love and that he is the very source of life and existence. Bible figures weren't strangers to God, nor was God a stranger to them. He was even closer than their best human friends, co-workers, or even the people they lived with. Let's compare closeness to God with what we consider closeness is in the human sense. If you considered someone your best friend, you would spend time with them. You wouldn't just go to them when you needed or wanted something from them. You would know many things about their nature and character. If they were wise, powerful, and lovingly there for you, you would listen to them on important matters. God is omniscient, omnipotent, and again and again the Bible teaches us that God is love itself. Each biblical character we've talked about had a loving, genuine, and consistent closeness with God. These persons of faith were sound and steady devotees of prayer and studied and regularly spent time with their sacred texts. This in turn prepared them for the facing of the day. They resiliently showed no signs of destructive cycles or syndromes after even the toughest challenges. Right. They stood on sound teaching by God's prophets and their Lord. Each biblical character consistently made a practice of giving God the honor due, lived meekly, and was freed of fear of pain and sorrow, and therefore saw that every day could be filled with benedictions new. These ways and means are beautifully cited in that way in hymn 171 of the Christian Science Hymnal. It's also helpful to recognize what was absent in any of the biblical figures. Those who triumphed over severe challenges didn't show pride, didn't indulge personal ambition, fear, resentment, nor did they succeed by merely willing their way through challenges by human efforts. People of prayer have great expectations founded on their history of seeing God's power in life events. They don't expect anything less than blessing. Science and Health by Mary Baker Eddy starts with just such an inspirational teaching. To those leaning on the sustaining infinite, Today is big with blessings. It is God, the sustaining infant, that is our source of sustainment in these demandingly paced days, in the long haul of deployments or other extended missions. As we saw in the earlier discussions of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, many of the people in positions of influence and rank became so impressed with themselves that what they thought they had accomplished by themselves, that they lost sight of moral and spiritual power. They stooped to human will and manipulation of others and lost sight of a higher, purer sense of success. True success isn't won by climbing over others and believing that your success has to come at their expense. 
true success is achieved by moral means and ways. It blesses everyone involved because it links us into God's rule of universal harmony that is all-inclusive. It isn't limited in any regard. We each fulfill our purpose and express our individual spiritual identity. We truly complement each other and everyone's outstanding character traits become an abundant pool of resources to join together to accomplish a mission that can bless everyone. Join to the goal of loving our neighbor. Mrs. Setti also shines a light on this higher sense of progress when she recorded this spiritual precept. Quote, God expresses in man the infinite idea, forever developing itself, broadening and rising higher and higher from a boundless basis. There is no sense of exhaustion when we naturally express the spiritual qualities God blessed each of us, his children, with. Relying on this heavenly inspiration, we are turning to a boundless spiritual source of intelligence and energy. There is no load of care or extreme deprivation necessary to simply take a step each day to unfold God's holy purpose for all of us in our day. Our next session, which is our third in the series, will consider the Apostle Paul, who, like many of the early Christians, was threatened on multiple occasions beaten and thrown in jail. He also survived a shipwreck that totaled the vessel and everyone ended up in a storm in the ocean on pieces of the ship and swimming to the shore without what we now have, maritime life preservers. Navy and Marine Service members may relate to their experiences even in very literal ways. Thank you so much for joining us. 